Although they once inspired love-starved sailors to envision mermaids swimming in the sea, manatees are no mythical beast. They are one of North America's most iconic mammals, yet these gentle herbivores face an uncertain future. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. It's manatee season on Explore.org, and to discuss their world, specifically the world of the Florida manatee, I'm joined by Cora Burcham, the Director of Multimedia and a Manatee Research Associate for Save the Manatee Club. And that's an organization, a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting manatees, their aquatic habitat, and aiding in the recovery of manatees throughout the world. And we partner with them to bring you several manatee cameras in Florida. So Cora is here to help us learn more about manatees, their conservation, and offer us insight on how to maximize your online manatee watching experience. And Cora, thanks so much for um, joining me once again for another chat. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited to be here and uh, talk about manatees. And I have, of course, uh, a lot of questions for you, as you know, um, but I know there's uh, many people at home who might be curious about manatees and have questions for you as well. So if you do have questions for Cora about manatees, drop those in the comments and a helpful moderator from Explore.org will be looking for those. And we'll try to answer maybe a few during the, the broadcast or maybe a few at the end of the broadcast. So thanks for your questions in advance. Uh, and Cora, you know, I have, maybe we should start with the basics about manatees. They're not an animal that uh, I guess people outside of uh, Florida or the um, Gulf Coast of, um, you know, the Southeast United States often have an opportunity to see. So can you uh, tell me what makes a manatee a manatee? Yeah, so manatees are these really unique creatures. Um, they're sort of the gentle giants of the sea. Um, they can get very large, average about 800 to 1200 pounds, and some can get much larger than that. And they're just kind of this cryptic animal, you know, they may be underneath you when you're kayaking or canoeing or something, and you wouldn't even really know that they're there. Um, so that's kind of what makes them so special. They have no natural predators, but are listed as a threatened species. So a very integral part here in Florida. A lot of people come to Florida to see these guys. So, uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's sort of what makes a manatee a manatee. And how, this is a, a two-part question. So how big are the adult Florida manatees and how, might, how long might they live? On your website, now the reason I asked that second part of that question is because on your website, savethemanatees.org, you have a great profile of a manatee nicknamed Brutus. And he's been seen at Blue Spring State Park since 1970. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brutus is actually one of our oldest manatees that we've kept track of. Like you said, he's actually he was first seen in the 1970s by Jacques Cousteau when he made his famous documentary, The Forgotten Mermaids. So manatees can live over 60 years of age. The oldest manatee on record was actually lived to be 69 years of age. Um, so Brutus, um, you know, since he was first seen in the 1970s, he could easily now be in his 50s or even in his 60s. So um, kind of hard to tell. Unfortunately, the average lifespan for manatees these days is only seven to 13 years of age. And that's that's really young. And that's because of all the threats these guys are facing. Um, and now, uh, regarding the size of a manatee, Brutus is actually one of the largest. He is about 1900 pounds, they're estimating, and he's over 10 feet long. So it's usually the females that get larger than the males because they have the calves. But the average is it's between 800 and 1200 pounds. Um, we do have some females that are well over 2000 pounds. So, um, so quite large. Well, Brutus is, is amply nicknamed then, I, I, I guess. Uh, and, you know, uh, when you when you look at a manatee, too, they have a lot of interesting um, physical characteristics and physical adaptations. And one uh, thing that I find it's very interesting about them is all their uh, vibrissae, which are you know kind of better known as whiskers on, on cats and dogs. And manatees seem to take the use of whiskers to another level though. So can you elaborate on the abundance of manatee whiskers and how those animals might utilize them? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're looking at a manatee, they're actually covered in these woolly tiny hairs, which those are the whiskers of a brissae. And cats and dogs only have them on their face. Manatees actually have them all over their body. And they actually use them as a sensory organ to sort of feel their way around in the water. So we believe they can detect currents, um, fresh water, warm water, all these kind of things with their hair. Their vision is not all that great, so they don't have really good eyesight, which makes sense because they usually live in very murky water. So having good eyesight, you know, really wouldn't 
wouldn't be all that beneficial to them. But they use these, these tiny hairs sort of as, as a sensory organ. So each hair is actually connected to a nerve ending in the brain. So they're as sensitive as our fingertips. So, um, so that's what they basically use to sort of navigate around. It's, it's really interesting. It's, it's fascinating. And when you look at the, the, uh, the body shape of a manatee, I mean, it just looks fat. Um, and they look also like a creature, you know, because of their, their body shape, like a creature that would be well adapted to live in cold water. But from what I've read, that's not kind of an accurate assumption at all. So why do manatees have that body shape? Yeah, it's really interesting. So manatees look like they're really, you know, fat and blubbery, but they actually only have about an inch of fat layer, which is, it's very thin compared to other animals. You know, if you're looking at like a walrus or a seal or a sea lion or, or something like that. So that's why manatees, they, they really cannot stay warm. So as, as soon as the temperatures drop below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, about 22 Celsius, sorry, 20 Celsius, they have to migrate to these warm water sites, such as springs or the outflow of power plants. They have a really, um, they have a very slow metabolism. So although they look really big, they're actually big boned. Uh, they have uh, they have very heavy, solid bones and they have um, a lot of intestines, a lot of internal organs. So that's sort of what makes up their, their big body shape. Um, so although they're, they're really big, they look really blubbery, they don't have a lot of fat. It's all, it's muscle and bones basically. So they have a lot of intestines in there. Uh, that brings me to my next question. How, how much food does a manatee need to eat each day? Of course, it's based on size, but I wonder if there's like a ratio um, that you could, uh, could, could, uh, could elaborate on that, on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So manatees actually eat about, or they can eat between 10 and 15% of their body weight. So like I just said, if a manatee, you know, weighs about 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, they can easily eat about 100 or 150 pounds of vegetation every single day. Um, vegetation, like as I just said, they are vegetarians, so they only eat um, submerged aquatic vegetation as well as some floating vegetation. Here in the, um, in the video right now you're seeing manatees eating some lettuce. This is at, at um, Homosassa Springs uh, Wildlife State Park where they have some permanent residents. Um, those manatees are not wild manatees so they're actually uh, being fed by the park staff there. Um, however, in the winter time, when manatees migrate to these warm water sites, they sometimes forego feeding for um, for a couple of days or even a week or two um, to stay warm. So so they don't have to eat 150 pounds every single day, but that's what they can eat. And they they only eat vegetation, so they don't eat you know they don't hunt after fish or anything like that. It's all it's all greens. <laughs> They're vegetarians. And that was it actually was an audience question that just popped up as well. Somebody was wondering, what do they eat? So, oh. yeah, so just just veg vegetarians. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah, they do eat submerged vegetation as well as um, floating vegetation. So some of the things that are floating on the water surface, like water hyacinth, um, small water ladders, pennyworth, those kind of things. So they don't just eat seagrasses, although that's a primary primary food source for them. They also eat some floating vegetation. And I've read that uh, a consequence of um, their lack of body fat is, and, of course, a, a slow metabolism that they have when um, is an increased risk for cold stress. So, uh, you know, we see in the wintertime, starting especially at this time of the year in Florida, manatees gathering around those warm water sites that you mentioned. So how susceptible are manatees to hypothermia and cold water stress? And how do they cope um, when the water temperature drops down? Yeah, so manatees, since they cannot sustain water colder than 68 degrees for prolonged periods of time, they really have to migrate to these warm water sites. If they don't do that or they don't do that in time, um, like you, you just said, they can develop a condition called cold stress syndrome. So they get like these white lesions all over their body, usually first on their face and on their flippers and their tail. Um, they get very lethargic, they become very thin, and basically their whole, their whole body, their whole metabolism shuts down. They're trying to conserve that inner core heat um, and basically they, they stop feeding. Um, so, so they can get really sick. Um, every, t every winter in Florida, we have manatees that die from cold stress syndrome or have to be rescued and then rehab for cold stress syndrome. So it's sort of a, a condition that we compare to sort of a mix between pneumonia, hypothermia and frostbite. Um, and that's the issue that they face if they don't find these warm water sources in time. That's why right now um, it's getting a little colder here in Florida and you can actually find these manatees in the hundreds at these warm water sites. And um, that's where they go, you know, they come from the coast, they come from the surrounding rivers and they migrate to these, to these warm water sites, which can be a spring or um, a outflow of a power plant. 
And it, it often seems like manatees are, are forced to choose. Um, and you touched on this just a little bit ago between food, uh, finding food and, and warmth in the wintertime. So how do they, I'm, I'm wondering how they, they manage that balancing act. Um, you know, both, of, both things can occur at the same time. Maybe they don't, they're going to a place that doesn't have a lot of food, but they need to stay warm. So I'm wondering how they're coping with that. Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's a question, that's a thing we're facing right now. So usually, like I said, they cannot sustain water below 68 degrees for prolonged periods of time. However, they can go out for shorter periods of time, go feed and then come back to the warm water side. Now, if there's food nearby, usually there is some food nearby those warm water sites. However, what we're seeing this year, primarily in the Indian River Lagoon here in Florida and on the Atlantic coast, is that a lot of the food sources are depleted. So manatees have to migrate out much further to find food. And that's something they cannot do during cold weather. Um, so that's when it really comes to the point where they have to choose. Do I stay warm here at the power plant and conserve energy? Or do I make that feeding trip, which can be you know hours away and potentially die of cold stress because I'm not finding food nearby. And that, that's a really big issue. Luckily um, for manatees, for example, at Blue Spring, there is enough forage around in the St. John's River that, so they can just go out for a couple of hours, come feed and then come back. So, um, so that's what they can do. Or then if it warms up for like a week or two, they may go out and feed and, you know, and then, then return to the spring when it gets cooler again. So cold is certainly, uh, I think, one of those natural risks that manatees um, have have dealt with. That, you know, ever since their, their species probably evolved. Uh, but let's take a moment to talk about some of the other risks that Florida manatees face in their everyday lives, especially those um, that people have brought into their existence. Um, the population of Florida manatees um, grew from, uh, according to some of the stats that I read, from about a thousand individuals in the early 1990s to about six to seven thousand in 2020 and that it seems like an encouraging trend uh, but it seems like there's also many reasons to remain concerned about the fate of manatees so what are the perpetual threats to manatee recovery and survival yeah yeah that's a great question especially because you just mentioned the numbers the num numbers have definitely gone up i mean i think that's something that you know no one is trying to debate that there are more manatees now than they were back in the 1970s or early 80s however manatees were actually placed on the endangered species list because of all the threats that they were facing. That was not because of the low numbers, but it was because of all the issues they were facing. And although they have no natural predators, they do face quite a few issues out in the wild. Um, primarily sort of the number one um, issue for them human related issue is collision with watercraft. Like we said earlier, they're moving very slowly about three to five miles an hour. So a fast speeding boat is just no match for a slow moving manatee. So a lot of manatees unfortunately do get hit by those boats. Um, we do see most living animals have scars on them from those collisions. So that's the number one issue for manatees all around Florida. Um, another issue for them is um, pollution, uh, getting entangled in monofilament fishing line, in crab traps and other sort of debris, um, ingesting things such as plastic or anything that's basically stuck in the vegetation that they're eating. You know, they go through there and they're grazing and they just take it all in. And if it's something that's not supposed to be eaten, um, you know, like pieces of plastic, pieces of cloth, uh, all those kind of fishing gear, they can end up in their intestines and that can be a really big issue for them as well. So, um, and then, you know, habitat loss, manatees are um, they live in coastal, shallow coastal areas. So they're usually very close to where people like to live. If you're looking at Florida, most people want to live by the coast. And that's pretty much exactly where the manatees are as well. So um, any, you know, anything that we're putting into the water from our septic tanks, sewer systems, fertilizer, all those kind of things um, that end up in the waterway, they can cause these massive algae blooms, which then cloud the waterways, kill the seagrasses off, so manatees don't have enough food sources. So that's another issue for them is these harmful algae blooms. And you mentioned um, uh, entanglements as one of the, the main threats to manatees, among other things. And well, I think we'll try to dig down into some of these, some of these threats um, a bit more specifically with the, the next few questions that I have. Um, but there, with entanglements specifically, um, you know, I think uh, there's a, a couple of, of manatees that might be able to help um, illustrate the stories and, and some of the hardships that they face. Uh, through that. Um, so can you introduce us to Una and Schwinn and how their lives have been impacted by, by debris and entanglements? 
Yes, absolutely. So both Una and Schwinn are actually mayor. These are Blue Spring State Park. So Una was very severely entangled in monofilament fishing line. We actually had to rescue her twice now for those entanglements. And you can see them here. That was really it was wrapped around her flipper. So she was rescued twice and rehabilitated. And during the second during her second stint uh, and rehabilitation, she actually lost part of the right flipper, um, sort of the lower part of it, which mantis can survive with just one flipper out in the wild. Um, you know that that's possible. Um, unfortunately, female manatees, they nurse their calves from little memory glands that are located behind those flippers. So oftentimes if the mother gets entangled in the fishing line, that can actually affect the nursing calf. So the last time we had to rescue Una, she did have a dependent calf with her. And we were seeing that the calf was having will issues nursing because her flipper was so infected. Um, so that was affecting the growth of the calf as well. Um, we do see that a lot. So luckily Una is back out there right now. She's doing really well. Um, no new entanglements as of right now, but it's definitely a reminder, um, you know, that that I can really affect um, amenities. And then Schwinn um, is another example that we have. Um, Schwinn was actually a manatee also at Blue Spring who was entrapped in a bicycle tire. Um, you wouldn't think that a manatee would be able to fit itself into a tire. We have no idea how it happened, but he showed up during the 2019-20 um, winter season and with this tire around his body, you know, very tightly wrapped. Um, we made, we, along with our many, many partners of the Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership, made many, many efforts to try to capture Schwinn and remove that tire. Unfortunately, he became more wary of us the more we tried to help him and we were unable to catch him. So luckily, this past year, he returned to Blue Spring without the tire. We don't know exactly how the tire came off. We do have a suspicion. Um, he did get hit by a boat towards the end of the previous winter season and it sort of like nicked the tire a little bit. So it could have potentially weakened the tire to the point where when Schwinn was growing and the tire wasn't, the tire sort of popped off. So along with our partners, we monitored him very, very closely because we had no idea if he had some sort of internal you know, injuries, um, any infection um, resulting from that wound around him. So luckily he's doing extremely well. Um, he returned to Blue Spring this season. So we're keeping a close eye on him to make sure he's doing well. But luckily so far so good. Um, it's just another reminder, you know, anytime you see, you see trash in the environment, no matter what it is, um, even if you didn't put it there, you know, please pick it up, please recycle it. Put it, I mean, it can, you know, manatees can get entrapped in pretty much anything. They're super curious animals. Like I said, they have these tiny hairs, these vibrissae that they use to feel around in the waterway. They like to check things out, um, not with their eyes. They like to check them out with their flippers and their snouts and everything else. And if they can squeeze themselves into something, they would certainly try to do that. Um, so try to, you know, remove as much of that stuff out of the environment so they cannot get entrapped or entangled in that. And Schwinn, I guess he had a really close call with uh, with a motorboat, um, but that's that's very common, it seems like. And, and a lot of the the the, uh, the encounters between manatees and motorboats aren't close calls; they're actually like boat strikes. Um, so, uh, can you maybe just talk a little bit more about motorboats and how they're dangerous to um, to manatees? And um, and and talk about about um, I think a couple of manatees that we had. Um, in our, in our queue here, Gator and Leslie, and, and their ability to sort of like persevere through injuries that um, that were caused by motorboats. Absolutely. So, I mean, almost every single Florida manatee has some scars on them from encounters with motorboats, meaning they have literally been about an inch or two from losing their lives. And those scars um, on their bodies show that. Um, this is Gator here. He was um, he was actually named after he was seen chasing an alligator or turtle um, across the spring run. And these are the scars that um, allow us as researchers to identify him year after year, which is really sad that that's what we're using to identify these guys. Um, it's obviously helpful for the research, but I wish we had something else to identify them other than their, their very severe boat strikes. Um, a lot of manatees, you know, they get hit and they don't make it. I mean, Gaeta here has been a really lucky one. Schwinn was lucky, um, a close call many manatees get hit multiple times. I mean, there are manatees um, that researchers have determined have gotten hit up to 40 times in their life. I mean, when they did the necropsy on a, on a deceased animal, they were counting the scar patterns and they found 30 or 40 different boat hits. So it's pretty sad to think that 
Um, you know, they don't have any natural predators. They can be seen in close vicinity with the alligators. Um, gator is uh, chasing one of them. Um, that's how he got his name. Um, and, you know, and these boats, it, it's, it's really, the problem is mantis are very slow moving and they're really difficult to see if you're not in a clear spring water. And um, the best thing boaters can really do is to go slow, um, watch out for these guys. And then if you do accidentally hit one, report it so that there is a chance that those manatees can be helped. Um, now, Leslie is another example. She is also a blue spring manatee, had a very severe boat strike. And she was rescued along with our partners. We rescued her in um, 2018. She was in rehabilitation for three years, which that's really, that's a very, very long time. Um, and there were really times when they thought that there was, she was not going to make it. I mean, they did a lot of experimental surgeries on her, gave her another chance. We uh, released her back out into the wild earlier this year and she returned a couple of weeks ago. And we even think that she's pregnant, which that's amazing. I mean, she was just released in January and um, is apparently already doing really well and able to contribute back to the wild population. So obviously that's always what the rescuers hope for, um, you know, that you return an animal to the wild and it can make an impact and um, and be able to, you know, survive. But that kind of wound that she had and those internal infections, they were very difficult to treat. So um, big kudos to those people who treated her for three long years. Um, that was not an easy task and we're really happy to, to see her back and she's doing really well now. Absolutely. Yeah. Go Leslie. I am, uh, I'm, I'm going to be curious this winter to watch the webcams and see if, if I can spot her and hopefully she'll come back in the future with a, a calf of her own. Um, you know, those are of course, uh, some, some very serious threats to manatees, but, um, the challenges they face seem to be continuing to mountain. Uh, in fact, uh, 2021 has been a particularly difficult year for Florida manatees. Um, current counts, um, more than 1000 have died already and it's about one in seven, um, Florida manate manatees. Um, so we have like boating and, and entanglements and the other, um, some of the other things that you've mentioned that are risks uh, to them. But we also had, um, you know, a viewer ask a question about um, who, who wrote, uh, Cora mentioned the depletion of the food sources for manatees in the wild. And what is causing this? And, you know, that's something kind of related to this. Um, I think from what I read, this um, this unusual mortality event that happened with um, a couple of different groups of Florida manatees um, uh, this year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately, like you said, this year we have lost over a thousand manatees, which that's a record that we, we never hoped to see. Um, the previous record had been 830 manatees, and that was already really high. You know, if you're looking at having 6,000 manatees, that seems like a really big number. Now, if you're losing 1,000 manatees a year, that number is suddenly not all that big anymore, especially because they're really slowly reproducing animals, so they cannot make up for a big loss really quickly. Now, the main cause for, for this die-off this year is, in fact, the depletion of their food sources, seagrasses mainly, along the Atlantic coast of Florida, especially in the Indian River Lagoon. And the reason for that is that over, over time, probably over a decade or more, um, water pollution has just sort of exacerbated. Um, you know, we have runoff from, from fertilizer, from agriculture, we have leaking septic tanks, we have sewer systems that are not functioning properly. So all of these kinds of nutrients getting into the waterways can then fuel these harmful algae blooms. And if you're having algae blooms clouding the waterways, the sunlight cannot reach those seagrasses. So the seagrasses, the plants, they need to photosynthesize. So if they don't have the sunlight necessary to photosynthesize, they'll die off. And then the manatees are left without a food source. Um, and that's, that's a particular problem right now in the Indian River Lagoon, where over, over years, so many algae blooms have happened that we're literally almost, I mean, we lost over 60% of the seagrass coverage there. And so if manatees cannot find enough food sources, especially during the winter months right now, um, that's what's happening. And that's sort of the main reason why we've seen so many manatees die this year alone, primarily in the first four months of the year when they were all congregating in that area. Um, after that, they dispersed a bit more, so they were able to migrate further out to find food sources. But now they're all coming back to that area. Um, so we're really on the lookout to uh, to make sure we can rescue as many as possible and just like get a grip on the situation to not make it any worse. And it's just not one type of algae from what I've read either. Um, can you explain how green and red algae blooms differ in the way that they can they can harm manatees? 
Yes, so um, there's sort of two types of algae blooms. The one I was just referring to that's really caused by this nutrient pollution, that's sort of the green or brown algae blooms. Um, what we're also seeing is a red tide. So red tide is a, is a natural occurring phenomenon. It usually occurs in salt water, um, more towards the southwest of Florida. Although this year we also saw a very severe red tide around the Tampa Bay, um, St. Petersburg area, and even in the Panhandle, which is historically, you don't really have all that much red tide issues over there. So what's happening with that is that the red tide produces these toxins. Um, it's, it's a neurotoxin. Um, if you've ever been to a beach um, and you inhale that, it, it, it's, it's really hard. I mean, it's really hard on your respiratory system. So manatees can either way inhale these toxins or they can eat them with the grasses that they're eating. And that can cause um, all sorts of neurological issues. Um, they develop seizures, um, they become disoriented and basically they can't surface to breathe so they'll drown um, if they don't get rescued in time so so that's another issue that's affecting them um, in addition to these these green and uh, and brown algae blooms that we've primarily been seeing in the Indian River Lagoon and somebody was wondering is the algae clearing up in Florida right now so maybe um, you could give us a, a little bit of an update on what you've been yeah. seeing in the waters off the coast of Florida yeah, absolutely. So I don't think right now we have any severe algae blooms going on presently, but we're seeing those consequences from these algae blooms that we've been happening over the years. So um, whereas the, uh, the effects of red tide, they're usually visible right away. Now effects from brown tide or, or these blue-green algae blooms, they're oftentimes not visible until years later. And the issue right now basically is, although we don't have any current algae blooms, the seagrasses are gone and they're not very easily um, very easy to replant. Um, you know, people think we can just replant all the seagrasses, but you really got to sort of clean up the system first before you can expect those seagrasses to grow. So a lot of projects are right now focusing on, on cleaning up the water quality in order to then be able to replant seagrasses to restore the food for the manatees. Um, unfortunately, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not something we can sort of fix overnight. Um, so I don't want to be too pessimistic. I do think that there is a way to turn this around. Um, but we all need to really work together right now to, uh, to try to make that happen. And of course, the, you know, the, the elephant in the room um, all across the planet right now is climate change. Um, so how might climate change and sea level rise impact manatees? Absolutely. And that's tying into that too. Um, we do have, you know, warmer waters where these algae blooms are usually occurring in warm water. So that's an issue. Um, salinity is changing. So with um, sea level rise and changing salinity levels, a lot of the plants um, cannot tolerate these higher or lower salinity levels. So they may be dying off because they're just not accustomed to that kind of um, salinity. Another issue we're seeing is increased hurricanes. Um, that can become a, a problem for manatees as well. That's killing off vegetation um, that may flood areas inland where manatees, you know, sort of go into somewhere where the water levels are up and then the water levels drop and the manatees get stuck. Um, another thing is with warmer uh, weather, and longer summers, we sort of see manatees migrating further out. You know, we see them going to Georgia and the Carolinas, which historically they've done that too. But now they oftentimes sort of like overstay their welcome. They stay there a little too long. You know, the waters get cold and they don't migrate back to Florida quickly enough. So we have this, this really warm weather and then suddenly, you know, boom, it gets cold and these guys are stuck up there. So they had to rescue quite a few already out of South Carolina, bring them back down to Florida. Um, so that's another issue. So usually when people hear um, climate change or, or global warming, they think that's a good thing for manatees because, you know, warmer waters, that, that's perfect for manatees. It just comes with a whole uh, a slew of other things as well that we sort of just need to keep in mind. And as we consider how, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, manatees are challenged uh, to survive uh, because of the changes and the dangers that humans have imposed on their habitat, uh, I also think it's really important to uh, to take the time to enjoy the animals themselves. I mean, they are fascinating creatures. Uh, we have, a, I think, a remarkable sort of window into a period of their lives on the webcams that we have at Homosassa Springs and at Blue Springs. Uh, so what can we expect to see on the manatee cams this winter? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I do primarily uh, my research at Blue Spring. And after all the negative things I have said, I really need to say that at Blue Spring right now, we're actually already seeing record numbers of manatees. So if you've looked at our webcams, I know a lot of people have commented, oh my God, there's so many babies. And that's true. Um, we have already seen 62 calves and it's only December 1st, which that's 
I think that's a record. We've never seen that many calves that early on. So that that's really nice to see that the population over there seems to be doing really well. Um, you know, they're, they're reproducing. They're, the survival rate seems to be pretty good. We've already seen over 600 individuals at Blue Spring. Um, those are over 350, I believe, or over 400 returned from previous seasons. So that's that's really that that's a nice thing to say. Um, at Homo Sassa, I think we had some really good uh, viewing uh, experiences last week as well. I've seen that a lot of manatees, including calves, on the webcam. So I think usually the cameras get more active in um, January, but right now it's only December, and I think we've already seen some pretty cool things um, over the last couple of weeks. Um, just the last two or three weeks um, when they started to come in. So um, I think we're going to see a lot of calves um, at Blue Spring. Um, you may see some other animals too. You may see some manatees interacting with alligators, um, seeing a lot of uh, birds, cormorants, those kind of things. Homo sassa, I know people really like to watch the fish. Um, right now in the winter time, there's these huge schools of fish that are coming back. You don't really see them in the summertime, but um, in the winter, there's just these massive schools of fish. So even on days when it's a little bit warmer and there's probably not as many manatees in, you see just these huge schools of fish, which is pretty cool to see as well. So I know people enjoy that. And the gathering of manatees at places like Blue Spring State Park represents um, or presents a unique research opportunity. You know, you get to study these large um, mammals, large numbers of them in the same place. They're easy to see there compared to other places. Uh, so how does um, your work with Save the Manatee Club contribute to manatee research? Yeah, so what we do is at Blue Spring, we do a live history program. So we basically keep track of those animals. Um, we talked about Brutus earlier. He's one of the oldest men. He's at Blue Spring. You know, he, we kept track of him since the 1970s. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, we, we study, you know, who has a calf? Um, what is the calf survival? How many manatees get hit by boats? Um, how many return from previous seasons? So that's, that's a really important thing to know to see how the population is doing. What we're also looking at is how many animals from the East Coast are potentially coming to use Blue Spring. Um, that's really important to know and see, you know, how, how's the migration going on over there. Another thing we're doing, we're assisting our partners with um, rescuing injured, sick or injured manatees. Um, we do keep an eye on that. Um, we do have a very small calf right now that we believe is orphaned. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, webcam is very helpful to see those guys as well. We're getting a lot of shots of that um, and pass that information on manatees that have been rehabilitated and are outfitted with satellite tracking devices. Um, those are another thing that we keep help keep an eye on as well. So, and on the webcams, it's just really nice to see these big aggregations. Um, so the webcams are a great tool for entertainment for the public as well as for our research. So that's a really big component there as well. And um, in some of our previous conversations, you've mentioned um, vanities nicknamed Annie and Lily um, and how they might uh, serve as examples, good examples of what you can learn um, through some of like your genealogy research and the other studies that you do at Blue Springs. So what do, what do Annie and Lily tell us about wild manatees? Yeah, so Lily is actually the oldest living female manatee at Blue Spring. Um, she's also been around since 1974, so almost like the same time that Brutus was first seen. Um, she can very easily be identified by her big white scars, especially the one down towards her tail. Um, she's had many, many calves. Actually, one of her calves, uh, Margarito, he's also in the Save the Manatee Adoption Program. So um, that's really cool that we have such an old manatee at Blue Spring. And she comes back year after year, um, which is really cool. Um, she's on our webcams. Usually that's an animal that's really easy to identify on the webcams. So if you're watching them, you'll probably get a get a good look at her. Um, Annie, she is definitely one of my favorite manatees. She was actually rescued as a really, really small orphan calf back in the day. And then they released her back at Blue Spring. She was outfitted with a satellite tracking device. And oftentimes orphans that are rescued at a very, very young age, with no experience out in the wild, they have a really, really difficult time adapting to being out in the wild. You know, they haven't learned from mom. They don't really know what to do. Um, now, Annie here is, is a prime example of a success story. Um, she gave birth to her fifth calf last uh, earlier this year. So she's had five calves so far, which is, is really amazing. Um, she's definitely contributing to the population. We've already seen her a couple of times at Blue Spring this winter. She was actually, I think she was there this morning. 
um, again, can be easily identified by um, some scars that she has there on her head, um, which she got off, off, obviously after she was released back out into the wild. And you can also sort of see there's like a little A6 on her that's a freeze brand. Um, they put that on her when she was released just because she had no identifying marks in order to keep track of her. Um, if she was to lose her tracking gear, um, that's why she has that A6 on her. There's very few manatees that have um, freeze brands um, for identification purposes, but she's been doing extremely well. Um, so a really great example for, for a success story where you rescue a tiny orphan calf rehabilitate it for two or three years and then put it back out into the wild and she's doing really well. So I'm excited for her. Um, and uh, yeah, both of them. I mean, they're both charismatic blue spring females. And we maybe just have a, a few more minutes left uh, for our conversation. Um, but one of my final questions for you is also a question that an audience member had. So um, somebody was wondering, how can people help manatees so what can someone at home do to ensure the survival of manatees yeah yeah that's a great question there are definitely a lot of different ways um you can help i mean first of all i want to just mention our adoption program which is just mentioned when i uh talked about annie and lily and actually all the manatees that we talked about today they're all in our adoption program so you can adopt a manatee you get a biography and a certificate of adoption and the money from that program goes towards our conservation efforts so it helps with manatee education outreach our legal advocacy efforts um, helping with rescue rehab and release which that's especially important right now since there's going to be so many manatees in need of rescue so um, obviously you can make a donation or you can adopt a manatee another thing you know everyone can do if you're out boating um, you know go slow in manatee habitat watch out for manatees wear those polarized sunglasses that makes it a lot easier to see manatees in the water um, you know participate in cleanups even if you don't live right next to a waterway um, you know, picking up any any pieces of trash, some manatees don't get entangled in those or don't don't ingest them. Um, try to not use as much fertilizer, especially during the summer months here in Florida. You know, if you're um, it, even if you're not living right next to a waterway, if you fertilize your beautiful green lawn and it rains right after it, all of that stuff, all of those nutrients wash out into the waterways, and it can be a big issue for manatees as well if they um, you know if they cause these harmful algae blooms. And if you are in Florida. Um, if you see a sick or injured manatee, you always report that to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the FWC. Um, they have a 24-7 hotline that you can call. So if you see anything that is sort of out of the ordinary and you think something is wrong, um, you can always call them. That's really something we're encouraging people to do right now because um, we're sort of preparing for, for the winter season where there may be a lot of manatees in need of rescue. and. Um, it's usually the public. It's oftentimes the boaters actually who call these manatees in. You know, they they see them. They're out there. They they're actually looking out for them. So it, it's definitely not um, save the manatee or manatees against the boaters. It's a lot of people from the boating community who actually help us. So um, so that that's a big thing as well. And then you know, educating others. If you're coming to Florida and um, or you know someone who's coming here, and you know, educate them about what you've learned about manatees. And there's a a lot of resources on our website too that you can you can take a look at or order some signs and brochures and all those kind of things as well. Plenty to do, um, and I I do have maybe one question that I'm I'm curious about, um, and I may have read this, but I may have forgotten. Um, uh, but this is an audience question as well. How long will calves stay with their mother mother you mentioned annie and that she's had five calves already but how long um in between sort of uh, reproductive events yeah usually calves stay with mom for about one to two years um during that time they will nurse and they will also start eating vegetation a couple of weeks after birth and then after about a year or two they usually get weaned um here at blue spring um surprisingly we do see um, calves being weaned after about 10 months to a year and then the females actually reproduce about every two years. In other parts of Florida, it's more every two to five years. Um, the pregnancy, the gestation is um, 13 months, so about a year. Um, so it takes them quite a while to reproduce um, and usually it's one calf at a time. Um, we do see twins, but it's pretty rare. It's usually just one, one calf. And my final question for you is, uh, is there a an individual manatee uh, with a story that that resonates particularly strongly with you? 
That is such a tough question. And I think we've almost addressed those manatees. I mean, Annie is definitely one of my favorites. And I think one of the reasons is that she, um, when she gave birth to her second calf, um, I was actually the first person who ever saw that calf. She gave birth to it overnight from a Friday to Saturday. And I was there Saturday morning at, at seven o'clock and there was the little calf. And it was just so very special. Um, I think it's just a memory that I will personally never forget. Um, seeing these tiny little calves. I mean, I personally think manatee babies are just the cutest creatures at all i mean of all of them um so just like seeing that was just it's, it's just so amazing and then seeing them growing up so and just sort of the resilience that these animals show i mean in animals like leslie and una um getting hit so severely you know getting so injured and and still being able to somehow survive um you know somehow still give birth to their calves and still care for them um, it, it's sort of a wake up call because, you know, we oftentimes complain if we cut ourselves on like a piece of paper or if you have like a slight headache or something. And these animals, the kind of stuff that they endure and oftentimes they don't even get, you know, painkillers or antibiotics or anything and they still pull through and they have the calves and take care of those calves. Um, that to me is just so amazing. So I think picking one is it's really difficult, but I think I always say Annie is sort of my my favorite one. <laughs> She sounds like a, a great choice. And um, yeah, it's it's been a great conversation. I've, I've enjoyed it. A um, lot to think about, especially, uh, you know, I was w watching an interview with um, Patrick Rose, who's the Save the Manatee Club's executive director uh, from earlier this year. Um, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, if Florida manatees can't survive due to habitat loss and water pollution, the things that we've talked about, then Florida will certainly be a much less habitable place for people. So helping manatees also helps people and i think every all the information that you shared today cora helps to illustrate um that that point so thanks so much for joining me today it was a great conversation yeah absolutely thank you so much for having me and i hope everyone enjoyed learning something about manatees so thank you my guest today was Cora Bircham from the Save the Manatee Club. If you want to watch our manatee cams, there's a couple different options to do that. You can go to explore.org, of course. You can also go to manatv.org. That's M-A-N-A-T-V.org. And if you want to learn about manatees, maybe the first place you should go is savethemanatee.org. They have uh, just a, a wealth of information on there. So it's a great website to check out to learn more about these incredible creatures. And my name is Mike Bitz with Explored.org. Thanks for watching today and have a great evening.